Hello, welcome to our first episode of Coffee with Cassie. Today, I'm at the beautiful Cafe Mercario in downtown Everett, enjoying my new favorite drink, butterfly tea, with our public information officer, Simone Tarver. Welcome, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm super excited for this. Simone, you're fairly new to our team, but you're a lifelong Everett resident, and so I know that you bring a wealth of expertise and experience is probably really helpful for you as our public information officer. Yeah, you know, it's been great. It's been such a great journey joining this team and really being able to use that personal connection that I have with the city and the work that I do every day. And that was one of the things that was most impressed me joining the team was just seeing so many people that really just want to work hard for the city and just the great diverse team that you've brought together. So it's it's been great. Oh, thank you. We're so glad to have you on the team. I, honestly, as the first woman elected mayor for the city of Everett, that was a top priority for me is to bring different voices to the table. I remember one of the first meetings I had and it was a room full of, of men. And I was like, okay, hey, and I think as mayor, I can, I can start to bring more voices. And so it's just great to have a wide range of age and, and experiences and genders and everything at the table. So I'm really glad you've joined us. Being new to the city, I'm really excited to hear more about this time before. We're talking about 2018 when you were first elected. And so to start us off, can you talk a little bit about what was going on in the city then? There was a lot going on in the city in 2018. And honestly, when I was running for office, we were seeing a, a dramatic uptick in violent crime, especially crime involving young people, which was really uh, alarming. We had a massive structural deficit that uh, the city had been dealing with for years and, and doing the best they could, but a lot of unsustainable practices. Um, we had a community that was, I think, uh, right that wanted to be more engaged. And obviously we also had homelessness and opioid crisis, crises um, that we were facing. And uh, I originally was part of the Community Streets Initiative, so had been doing some work on that. And then as Alpha say, as a city council member, but yeah, those first years were really focused on that. And then first couple of years, I guess, in that, but then we were hit by a global pandemic. So when I think about the first four years, there was a lot going on in the city. Well, there certainly was a lot going on in those that time. So shortly after coming into office, I know you identified some main priorities for specifically public safety, economic development, community engagement, and of course, addressing the budget. So how did you come up with these priorities? Uh, it was actually easy to come up with these priorities because uh, they were things that I heard time and time again when I was talking to community members prior to uh, uh, taking office. Shortly after uh, being elected, uh, we had a mayor's transition team, a really broad group of community leaders and community members that provided input into what they saw as the top priorities that uh, the new administration should focus on. And so it was uh, pretty clear that these were the issues that we should be digging into and I wanted to issue my first mayoral directives around them. Yeah, and even right there, another opportunity to bring different voices to the table and really get involved at that ground level of what you're going to do in those first four years. So I noticed these priorities seem to touch kind of the biggest issues and the biggest things that are impacting people that live here in Everett and things that our residents really rely on us for. So with these priorities in mind, what was your vision for the city going into that first term? Well, I think it's the same vision I have today. I, I wouldn't say our vision has changed that much. Uh, safety is front and center. I think you need a community where residents and visitors are safe and feel safe. That is one of the core things that government's responsible to do. Community engagement was equally important. You know, uh, having to know we're doing good work in government, I think we need to be able to listen and hear from those diverse voices throughout our community. So having a back and forth communication between government and the community was really important and that remains important today. Healthy economy, making sure that Everett is seen as a business friendly place that for small coffee shops like this could thrive, but also major industries like aerospace, you know, Boeing here, right here in our backyard. That is important for our jobs, but it's also important to fund all the things that people want to see their city provide them, uh, to fund a, a really wonderful quality of life for our residents. And the last one, uh, you know, kind of ad addressing the structural deficit, dealing with the city's finances, well, we couldn't sustain any of the important programs that we have for our residents if we're not really uh, managing our finances well. So that's, that was and remains a top priority today. I think that the vision you're describing, I think it's something that a lot of people in our community would love to see become a reality. So what was your plan for moving us toward that more engaged, safer future Everett? 
we started with some mayoral directives. And I think that was a new tool that we hadn't seen in our community before. But they're really just a way for a mayor to publicly direct staff to do some important work. And I directed staff to do work in each of these priority areas as a way for ensuring that our staff teams were all rowing in the same direction uh, towards the same goals. Also allowing the public to know what we were doing, kind of holding ourselves accountable uh, to those goals. And so we issued five mayoral directives to, to guide us in those first year and a half or so. That's great. I think that accountability component is, is great. And I think it's something that the community really appreciates being able to know what you're doing kind of along the way. So I know public safety is and has been a big concern and a big focus for you. And uh, so when you first took office, I know one of your first directives was the youth gun and gang violence directive. So can you tell me a little bit about that directive, how it's impacted the community? It was the very first directive I issued and it was um, such an issue I was very passionate about. Uh, had multiple conversations with Chief Templeman. We were both very passionate about it. There had been a a uh, child that was shot and killed by another child late the year before. And that was just devastating for the families, for our entire community. And the chief and I discussed how important it was to do something about that. And uh, so the directive kind of outlined a, a plan for what we could do to address youth gun and gang violence. Some of the work included standing up a gang response unit. Um, and so we did that. We put officers on a new unit and their primary focus was proactively addressing uh, gang violence in our community. And we saw a 40% reduction um, with standing up that unit. So I think it was a really good uh, focus for us the, uh, early on. We also wanted to improve transparency into the work that we were doing in, in police. Uh, so really putting open data and, and sharing our, our data with the community was really important. We distributed 200 free gun locks, and I think we've done many more since then, and we still have gun locks available. So if there's anyone in the community that wants them, uh, we can still give you them. But I think that's just a, a no-nonsense way of like, hey, if you have a gun, let's, say, let's make sure it's safely locked and stored. Uh, we also did a couple of prevention programs, and I think these were really uh, important first steps in engaging with the community. To create those programs, we had a, a community uh, task force or a, a group of community leaders that were advising us on what they needed to see to uh, make our kids safer in their communities. And so uh, we came up with these two prevention initiatives. One is called Pathways for Adolescent Youth. And it's really a way of connecting at-risk youth with positive community role models. And so that was a, a very good program. And I think some of that work now is being done outside of the city. That's sometimes what's important. So city leaders or police department isn't always the best suited to continue this work, but sometimes we can kick off initiatives that then other organizations in the community continue. The other uh, prevention program that we started was Positive Intervention Outreach Team, Pivot. And it's a multidisciplinary team, so kind of like wrapping around care and services and support around youth that might need that extra support to ensure that they either are not entering uh, a gang or more violent um, group of friends, um, or that they are able to kind of leave that environment. And so again, those two programs, I think were, were really important part of this initiative. That sounds great. I think it's especially impactful um, how much it was really focused on those community partnerships, because as you said, sometimes government, sometimes police aren't going to be the one to provide that service. So it's great that the city was able to provide that, that groundwork to keep that work going. Yeah, absolutely. So also kind of in the public safety realm, you launched the Safe Streets program. So can you talk a little bit about what the, that program was and what you intended that to do? Yeah, I'll, I'll, first I'll correct you. I didn't launch the Safe Streets program. That existed before I took office. Uh, Mayor Stephenson uh, launched the Community Streets Initiative, and that was a group of uh, leaders in the community and neighbors and individuals that cared passionately about addressing the street level social issues we were seeing. And from that work, uh, the city started the Safe Streets kind of work. Um, and then I issued a directive on that work. So that kind of that was a continuation of some of the good work and perhaps setting some new priorities. And so that work in those first years was it brought 170 new supportive housing units to the city. And again, this is led by other organizations. Other, you know, the city isn't building all of those units. It's organizations like Housing Hope and Cocoon House and uh, Catholic Community Services that are building those programs, although the city did uh, very much support Claire's Place with uh, 
supportive housing, I think 65 units of supportive housing. We also had our co-ed team and the work that they were doing connecting 1,500 people in that first uh, year in 2019 after issuing this directive with services. So just increasing their focus and, and priority prioritization of helping connect people to services. So CHART uh, is another program that was supported by the uh, Community Streets Initiative work, but then later through this directive. And that was work to help uh, individuals that we're chronically engaging with different systems in the in the city or in the broader community even. And these are systems that are really expensive and not really helping. They're just maybe short-term band-aids, whether it's somebody getting assistance in the ER or somebody entering the criminal justice system. Those short-term uh, assistance wasn't really helping them exit life on the streets. And so having a team of diverse professionals really taking 20 of those individuals and saying, how can we help get them long-term care so that they are safely housed and maybe getting the treatment or other supports that they need. We also had a Safe Streets work crew kind of cleaning up our downtown, um, really helping make our business community a little safer, a little uh, easier to access. But then the, the folks that were doing that work were folks that would have been entering the criminal justice system, but it was like a diversion program for low-level misdemeanor crimes rather than having to go through the whole criminal justice system process, really, hey, how about you work and, and clean up our downtown with us yeah. and, and be a part of uh, kind of the solution to some of the challenges that we we're seeing in our community. Another important part of the directive was we, were, we, we still are seeing uh, just this skyrocketing problem with opioid epidemic. And we wanted to make sure that if an individual in our community needed care, that they could get it that very day. You know, there's not enough treatment beds, there's not enough detox beds for everybody, but there is medically assistant treatment. And so we partnered with Ideal Options to ensure that if there was an individual in the city of Everett that needed support, that that same day they could begin medically assisted treatment, which is really important. I know the opioid epidemic and addressing those challenges is a big part of the Safe Streets Initiative, as well as a big priority even to this day. So can you talk a little bit about what was included in that initiative really related to opioid um, treatment and um, kind of addressing those issues in our community? Obviously, as you said, this remains a really big priority now, but in that early directive, uh, in addition to the things that I already mentioned, we wanted to make sure that our staff teams had naloxone. Um, so not just uh, our fire department, but our police, now our librarians. So really making sure a public works team that uh, any of our uh, forward facing teams that might come in contact with an individual who was overdosing on opioids, that we could uh, provide them immediate assistance and, and save their lives. And so that uh, is an, was an important part of this and remains an important part of our work to this day. The other thing is we wanted to make sure that we had treatment available on demand for individuals needing treatment. When somebody is uh, in experience to severe addiction, suffering from substance abuse disorder, it's not like every day is the same. There's a moment there where they really want and can follow up on treatment. And if we don't provide treatment in that very moment, we've lost that moment. And it might be days, weeks, or even months before they're ready to receive treatment again. We wanted to make sure that with a lack of detox beds, with a lack of inpatient treatment, that we at least had medically assisted treatment on demand. And so we partnered with Ideal Options and they have been a fantastic provider to connect people to that medically assisted treatment to help get them off of the dangerous opioids uh, long-term. Wow, so a lot going on with public safety. And it seems like a lot of that helped kind of lay the foundation of a lot of the programs and initiatives that we're working on now. So it's cool to kind of take it back there and, and see where it started out. And I know we'll be covering the new stuff in one of the future episodes, so that'll be great. So beyond public safety though, you focused very heavily also on finding ways to make the most out of Everett's opportunities because there are tons. And so can you talk a little bit about your vision for the city's um, economy and then also um, your economic development directive? Everett is an amazing place for business. and. We are a major job center in the region. I think sometimes our community, our residents uh, forget that, that this is a major job center, not only for aerospace and manufacturing, but for healthcare, uh, the green economy. There's a lot of really growing industries here in Everett. So part of my work I felt early on was 
marketing what we already had, marketing this amazing community that we have. This is a place where you can make it, you can build things, you can start a small business, you can relocate your large business, and that we have created a, a welcoming business community. We have a skilled, amazing workforce here. Uh, so this is a fantastic place for, for, for businesses, especially in aerospace and manufacturing, or especially in healthcare or maritime, to locate their businesses because we already have the workforce here to, uh, that they will need to, to staff their organizations. Outside of just marketing us as a business-friendly community, I wanted to just market Everett. People don't know how beautiful our city is. And I was just at an event uh, recently uh, here in our city and people were like, wow, I had no idea Everett was this beautiful. I'm like, did you never leave I-5? Uh, we really have, we have an amazing waterfront. We have a historic downtown. We have fantastic uh, coffee shops and restaurants and, and small businesses and really wanted to make sure that uh, our community saw Everett as a destination, even just for the day or a weekend. So we focused a lot of energy in that directive on our branding of Everett, marketing Everett, tourism. Uh, we launched Visit Everett. It's a whole uh, tourism initiative and website really uh, advertising the beauty of the city, of our economy, of our quality of life to tourists, businesses uh, far and wide. And I think that's been really successful. Yeah. So I know there were some other kind of big improvements around the city that happened around this time um, that would really help to attract more of these businesses and continue to make this a great place to not just live, but also to visit and to, you know, start a business, run your business. So can you talk a little bit about some of those things? I know transportation was one of the big ones. Yeah, sure. I think for a business to want to locate in a community, you have to have good infrastructure. And some of that work was, uh, again, kicked off by the previous administration, um, which was fantastic. Uh, uh, we had our Rucker Streets Renewal Project going on, and I know that was really hard for our local Rucker business community to deal with our streets being, you know, in, in disrepair during that renewal process. But now we have a really beautiful, walkable great Rucker Avenue that uh, I think better serves those businesses. And it also redirects the, the freight that goes through our city with a working industrial port outside of the downtown, which I think also helps all of us. So that was a, one of the infrastructure projects. Another really great one was our Grand Avenue Park Bridge. And again, that work, I remember I was on the city council when I did the, the groundbreaking for that work with Mayor Stephenson. And then of course I got to be at the grand opening of our Grand Avenue Park Bridge and I love taking walks there every day and seeing our residents out there, but it's not just a feel good project. It's actually a project that helps our infrastructure. You know, we are uh, the regional water provider uh, to not just the city of Everett, but the greater uh, region here. And so that is, uh, is for water runoff. And it was a necessary infrastructure project that we made into a beautiful bridge that I think also really helped our residents. Uh, Everett Transit has been making some huge strides in electrifying our fleet. We had to cut back uh, early on in my administration on some of the routes because we just were that even the, the, our transit uh, arm of our organization was also struggling. Um, but we've been able to add those many of those routes back in. And we have a beautiful electric fleet that I think makes for nice, quiet buses, environmental friendly buses. And I think we won awards for being one of the most environmental friendly companies for transit around. One of the top parties that you mentioned earlier, community engagement. Um, especially strengthening the city's relationship with communities of color and our youth. Um, I know you had a directive about this, so can you talk a little bit about your uh, community engagement and uh, inclusion directive and why this was a top priority for you kind of right off the bat? I think we focused briefly on why it's top priority, but it, it really was about ensuring all voices are heard in the city. Uh, for a long time, I had the feeling, and I think some of our residents shared this, that it was a more small group of uh, people that had access to government and could, you know, complain to government or make their voices heard or be a part of decision making in, in city leadership. And I've, I felt really strongly that we needed to hear from a much broader group of our residents. We need to hear from North Everett, from South Everett from our communities of color, from our LGBTQIA plus community, um, different uh, ages. Uh, and so that has been a, a real important goal of this administration. Uh, one of the things that was in that directive was uh, hearing from our youth. And as a, a, my, my previous position before I became mayor, I led an organization helping youth. So I've always really uh, valued youth voices. 
but especially in government, you know, the decisions we're making are not necessarily going to impact my life. Like I think about sound transit, for example, but boy, are they going to impact the lives of generations to come. And so I, I feel like we shouldn't be making decisions for these generations without hearing from those generations. So part of the directive was creating a youth advisory board, which I'm so excited that we have. We have a fantastic youth advisory board that works with our engagement director and, and, and the team uh, to provide advice to me and my administration on any number of topics all across the city from safety to parks to whatever priorities we're working on. And so I really appreciate and value their voices and our boards and commissions across the city, I think historically were um, maybe one demographic or even one uh, neighborhood in the city or just a couple neighborhoods were represented on those boards and commissions. And now our team works to review those applications and, and recruit across the city to, to diverse organizations uh, and advertise as much as possible when we have openings. But then as we're recruiting, we, we look at what are the different experiences this person is bringing? Are we going to get a different perspective on this uh, border commission? Uh, what part of the city do they live in? You know, is this, uh, are we representing all the different ages and ethnicities that are impacted by the work of this commission? So that has been a goal, and I think we've really successfully diversified our boards and commissions. And then lastly, I, you know, another part of the directive was really looking at the organization of the city itself. We were historically very white uh, and, you know, um, I guess mostly over the age of 40, um, which is great. There's a lot of wisdom with, with folks in that demographic. Um, Everett is 75% white, so you would expect to have some, uh, you know, a lot of white, white people in our administration, but we were really missing communities of color. We were really missing uh, voices from across, uh, uh, across the age spectrum and uh, across life experiences. And so as we have had openings in the city, we have really focused on what, we, what can we do to recruit more diverse voices. And I'd say that one of the departments that has done this exceptionally well is our police department. They have really been recruiting communities of color and women uh, and in an organization that, that was historically very white, white men, and I, you know, I remember having a conversation with uh, a couple of our community leaders, uh, I think in the NAACP, and they said, hey, your police department, your administration does not reflect this community. And so it's taken a long time. <laughs> Government things move slow. Um, but it is nice to see uh, so many more diverse voices coming to our city teams and adding their experience to the work we're doing. Yeah, and I know a big part of that is the really inclusive environment that you've been able to build within the city, you know you're not gonna see that kind of diversity in a place where people of color don't necessarily feel safe or feel like um, they're part of that group. So I, I think that's definitely a big component of it. And it seems like something you've really focused on is those inclusive environment. Yeah, we and, and it's a work in progress. You know, I, I know we still have a lot of work to do. We have uh, teams in our, our, our engagement team and our HR team, and we have a staff engagement team that uh, is working to hold me accountable, to hold our administration accountable, to hold the city accountable on the policies and, and work that we're doing so that we can make sure that everyone that is a, employed with the city has a safe and inclusive environment. So we'll keep up the good work and try to do better. So one of the biggest challenges that you had to face coming into office was addressing the budget. So I know Everett had a very serious, as a serious structural deficit, and that's been a problem for a while. And so I know you issued that budget um, directive pretty early on. And so I know you had to make some really, really challenging deep cuts kind of right off the bat. So can you take us back to that, talk a little bit about what you did and kind of why and how it's helped, how it's helped a tough situation? You're bringing up painful memories. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, right after I took office, um, I, actually our finance department sat me down and said, it's bad, Cassie. We've got, you know, we have a structural deficit and it's probably worse than you realize and walked me through the budget and just an in-depth level, right? As a council member, you, you, you get some information, but as mayor, you have to take that deep dive because I'm, I'm in this 24 seven and I'm responsible for making sure that we have the resources to do the work that we've promised the community. So uh, I think one thing that's important to note is that Everett is a full, full service city. I mean, we're a super full service city. 
we have a transit agency. We are public works, uh, a regional water utility, as I mentioned. Um, we also have the streets and, you know, we take care of the basic infrastructure of our city. We have a police department, a fire department, a library, an animal shelter, and then all the other services that cities have, whether it's you know, the planning department and your internal operations of making sure your city is running smoothly. Um, so there's just a lot of work that the city does that our, uh, our community might not know uh, that is unusual for a city to provide. And so that means the expense of running Everett is far greater than many other cities of our size. With that, that first year in office, we were facing a $13 million deficit as we were trying to plan our budget for the next year. Big gap. And so welcome to your job, Mayor. Cut $13 million out of your budget. Um, had to make some tough choices. Uh, really zeroed in on um, programs that I felt were core to the services people expect their government to provide. Uh, robust parks department, uh, safe streets, public safety, right? So kind of those basic programs and had to really look at other programs that we love to provide that, but that perhaps we couldn't afford long-term. Uh, some of the first cuts were some of our recreation programs. To protect parks, you know, had to kind of think, well, what are the recreation programs that a city doesn't have to provide? And the cool thing is, is we've been able to continue to provide many of those services through public-private partnerships. That's been one of the major things that we've done to address our structural deficit. And that first year, not only did we balance that budget, which was a feat, but we permanently cut 5.6 million out of the budget at that time, really by shifting how we do business, reorganizing city teams, uh, looking at public-private partnerships, looking at different ways that government uh, or that the city can be a part of work that's happening, but maybe we don't have to be the direct provider of that service or work, and that will save our residents uh, uh, money and also ensure that some of these programs can continue. The reason Everett has a structural deficit is due to the fact that Again, like I said, we're a full service city, but there's also um, a cap on property tax. The way a city is funded is through property tax, sales tax, B&O tax, uh, and property tax in the state of Washington is capped at 1% increase every year. Uh, that's a pretty uh, significant cap because the cost of running a city even in the best of times without like skyrocketing inflation like we saw in the last year it goes up about 4% a year. With inflation like we recently saw, our expenses went up by 8 9%. So if one piece of your funding is capped at 1%, your hands are really tied. Your cost of running the city goes up every year, and the money that's coming in to support that is less every year. So it really forces us to be very strategic in where we um, put our, our resources, and it's gonna be a challenge that we have to address in the, in the coming months. And so I'm sure we'll be probably be spending another coffee chat talking about our budget because although we did a lot of work in this first few years, there's still work to be done to ensure a sustainable city. Yeah, and I like that you uh, kind of clarified that it's not so much that um, there are excessive expenses or necessarily anything that the city is doing it's just it's expensive it's just expensive to run the city and if revenue can't keep up if incoming money can't keep up we don't really have a whole lot of options to be able to provide everything with everything that they're expecting which is tough yeah yeah no we reduced our 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 staff teams pretty aggressively those first years again we reorganized folks we we looked at every area of business that the city was doing and thought, how can we do this with uh, and, 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 and have it cost less for to our residents? And so um, for folks that think that we have this robust city government that's big and expensive, we've made it as efficient as possible, um, but we still have some work to do as a community to ensure that we can have everything that we, we really want to see to enjoy the quality of life here in Everett. It is kind of hard to believe you've accomplished all of these things just in your first couple of years in office and so many more things since then that I think will get covered in future coffee chats. But uh, what would you say is the key to your success? What really drives you to do this work and to care about the community this much? 
Well, I would say that it's not my success. It is really our community's success. It's our, our, it's our staff team. It's the entire community of Everett that has helped us do this important work these last few years. You know, I'm a resident of Everett, of course. I'm a passionate member of this community. I love the city. And just as a, as a resident, as a mom, I want this to be a strong, healthy environment for my neighbors, my friends, my daughter, her friends. And so I'm, I'm pretty passionate about uh, doing everything I can to make Everett a strong, great place to live. Uh, when I first took office, I spent uh, my first uh, few months uh, doing my best to meet all the employees of the city. And we have a lot uh, in all of these different departments that I shared. And so wanted to get to know who these folks are, the public servants that are taking care of our roads, that are taking care of our parks, that are keeping us safe. And I was so impressed. Uh, the people who work for the city of Everett are passionate public servants. They care deeply about Everett, about our residents. They want a safe community. They want uh, great infrastructure. They want a high quality of life for our residents and they're working really hard every day. And so they are really the reason that we are successfully moving so many of these initiatives forward. And I think what makes the, the job rewarding uh, is is our amazing residents. You know, um, I've often said that, you know, what makes Everett special outside of our beautiful waterfront and, you know, beautiful views and, you know, all these things that we have is it's really our residents. The the people in Everett care deeply and passionate about each other, about our, about our city. Um, and that is why it is an honor and privilege to serve <laughs> the city because we really do have such outstanding residents that uh, are part of this work. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to join this episode. I know it can be hard to remember all of the good things that have happened over the years. I think sometimes it's easier to remember the not so good things. So I think sometimes it's good to, to kind of remember and reflect and just think about all the things that have been accomplished with your initiatives over the past six years, because there's, there's just so much. Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, we have a really incredible team. I, I very much appreciated this walk down memory lane. Uh, I loved our conversation, and I kind of wish we could do this every day and just, like, talk about the, what the work we're doing, because we're all so busy doing the work that we actually don't have a lot of time to look back and reflect on what we have accomplished. Uh, often it's the bad news that comes up. Um, so I often don't get to reflect on some of the good work that we're doing, but it was really fun to, to go through some of, the, some of the great work that our teams have been leading for these last years. Thanks again, Simone, for joining me today. I had so much fun talking to you. Really enjoyed our conversation. And there is so much more for us to talk about. Each future episode will be dedicated to digging into an important topic here at the city and more of the great work that's, that our teams are doing. My hope is that after watching these videos, our viewers, our residents feel better informed, as well as empowered to make their voices heard on all these critical issues. I also hope it's you, you can find a way to get involved and make a difference in our community. I'd like to do one last shout out to Cafe Macario for letting us use this beautiful space and for the delicious tea, as well as the Downtown Everett Association for helping us scout locations to do these coffee chats. So thank you for joining us for our first Coffee with Cassie, and I look forward to seeing you next time.